Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for connecting today. It is a pleasure to have you at our seventh event in 2023. My name is Yesenia. I am the lead developer of Code for Development Team, and I am going to be your host for this workshop. And first of all, I want to reinforce our commitment to open source. The IDB was the first multilateral to establish an open source repository for public management in 2017. Our mission was always clear, to equip public managers in Latin America and the Caribbean with the strategic open source tools that amplify their impact. We believe that by providing open source software tailored to the needs of governments, we can foster innovation, efficiency, and effectiveness in public management practices. Implementation workshops are critical to implementing the, that mission. Here is a safe space for you to clear up all your doubts, all your questions about the implementations of various tools, such as frictionless data, so that you can later implement them in your own agencies. And before passing the floor to our speaker today, I would like to do a little housekeeping. The fact of registering to this or other Code for Dev Network event does not mean that you have joined the Code for Dev Network. To get all the benefits of being part of the network, like access to all our events, the Slack group that we have, and much more, don't forget to sign up. Let's, we're going to put the link to the, to the sign up webpage later in the chat. I would also like to thank the entire Open Knowledge Foundation team, a fantastic organization that is very focused on supporting the opening of data by governments and training, and training public management uh, managers in this new skill, which is super important for governments. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Evgeny Kareb from the Open Knowledge Foundation team, who is going to lead this frictionless data workshop. Evgeny, thank you very much. And let's go forward with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, it's great to see so many people interested in uh, opening data and uh, open data standards. And uh, my name is Evgeny. I am a tech lead of the Friction Data Project at Open Knowledge Foundation. And uh, today I'm going to uh, present the project in general and uh, some models uh, to the audience of uh, Code for Dev. So, um, shall, shall we? Okay. Um, first of all, uh, we are uh, we're open open knowledge foundation and it's a uh, uh, foundation that been uh, opening data for us 20 years we're going to celebrate our anniversary uh, very soon and uh, um, we uh, really open data enthusiasts so basically all our projects most of them uh, were and are uh, dedicated to openness and uh, as uh, said, uh, working with governments uh, to open data. So uh, currently we're working on a fair and sustainable future for everyone, but on the data fronts. Uh, our mission uh, is kind of really global, so we have different aspects of our work, and uh, namely, it's uh, data open data, and not only data open standards, uh, software uh, training, as said. Uh, so, frictions data uh, comes to the this category. It's uh, software and standards, and not only frictions data. I think open knowledge. Uh, mostly known for developing uh, CCAN, which was presented uh, at CCAN for Dev a few months ago. Uh, but also uh, we worked on 
uh, Open Data Commons and, for example, Open Definition, which now is being uh, reworked for the next version currently. But also at the Open Knowledge Foundation, uh, we do data advocacy. And um, we had projects like Open uh, Data Index, uh, which was the kind of like a rank country or like cities rank for data openness. It, it was a uh, big project with uh, its own uh, uh, kind of like system for openness ranking and uh, structure, um, open spending, um, open budget, and uh, other projects that was uh, that were uh, intended to uh, advocate for the open data uh, principle. And um, of course, community is uh, really important and it's uh, really important for, for us as well. So I think maybe some of, of, of you uh, have heard about the uh, School of Data project, which currently is also being uh, in transition and uh, we're hosting uh, Open Data Day. Currently, we created a new, really interesting uh, things called Project Repository, really similar, I think, thing to the uh, what Code for Dev uh, does, and uh, Global Directory, which is a directory of open data experts, enthusiasts, specialists, so you can uh, register there. Um, and uh, yeah, we are part of uh, CSVConf uh, for quite a long time already uh, and helping to uh, organize this conference uh, related to table or data. Um, so it was like initial introduction of the open knowledge, but today we're going to talk about uh, the problem. Uh, the problem uh, is data still uh, exists and uh, it's been like a long time of uh, data being like really vital part of uh, society but still for example uh, this uh, uh, famous uh, case uh, when uh, the Czech was able to find out that uh, thirty percent of published articles related to uh, biology were just uh, incorrect because of just simple uh, Microsoft Excel uh, date like uh, typing. Uh, when Excel, I mean, when Excel just changed the type of your column from uh, uh, letter to date or something like this, and uh, it just broke the whole. Uh, pipeline of scientific work and it happened like not on the uh, stage when uh, scientists were working on data engineers it was it was it was data it was broken in the in the beginning and I set uh, garbage in garbage out so there's a problem uh, and frictions data project basically the main uh, mission of the project uh, was and is uh, to solve this data interoperability problem. Um, and a little bit of history. Initially, as, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Open Knowledge created CCAN, and at some point, yeah, people realized that they were publishing a lot of CSV files, but uh, it was not fully useful and usable because uh, those files didn't have uh, additional information, metadata, uh, schemas like column types, etc. And having these, uh, Rufus Pollock, uh, the initially the creator of uh, friction data, uh, decided to start this project uh, from data standards. Um, so it was uh, an introduction. Uh, shall we have a quick uh, questions session? Uh, we don't have any questions for now, but 
I was thinking of asking you, Evgeny, about um, these errors that you mentioned in the data. Can you tell us about any specific case that you've seen um, this opportunity to improve the processes and the standards? Um, yeah, so uh, the case I was uh, talking about uh, happened, I think, a few years ago. And actually, it was like, it's, a, it's, it's hard to believe how simple it was. It was a uh, biologist uh, were sharing their uh, raw data in Excel. And uh, Excel just uh, automatically formatted uh, formatted some columns to uh, other type. And no one did realize this at the data stage. So basically, um, I mean, it's, 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 it's a real, it was a real thing. And it's, uh, I think it's only one of uh, a lot of examples like this, but uh, just to get us like uh, going. So how frictions data could help in this case. So frictions data is data standards and data software. And when you, uh, when dot biologists, uh, for example, if they had created a table schema for their uh, Excel files, uh, then validator will catch this wrong uh, uh, cells, which was uh, corrected by Excel. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I have a question here from Brandon. He says, I would like to know what are the implications of having these mistakes? How, how do these mistakes could affect our work? Um, yeah, so it's a really good question. Uh, so happy again, like staying on this exact case. So basically what happened? Uh, the, mis uh, the, the mistakes in the data, then it the data went to the data engineering, let's say, uh, department like on some universities. And then they shared it with data scientists and they, uh, data scientists actually created, not only like data scientists, just scientists, biologists, published, they published articles. I mean, the, the, the really like published articles on, on journals, which was then uh, reverted not because scientists were, uh, were wrong or they had a bad uh, like idea of uh, like experiment or something or it was just data and uh, it's um, kind of like so many resources uh, usually it's kind of like funds and public funds uh, government money was spent on on the work that just didn't make sense from the beginning. So our goal is to catch these problems at the beginning and uh, uh, kind of like prevent cases like this. Thank you, Evgeny. To go to the next part of the workshop, I have these questions related to the to to this next part. Um, Osvaldo Leiva asks, how frictionless data guarantees the interoperability and standardization of the components from, a, from one interpretation? And if this is a uniformized use in different platforms and applications? I think the next part of the, of the workshop can, can explain yeah, this yeah. It's, it's a good it's a good pass <laughs> so awesome. i can take it um yeah thanks a lot for this question and yeah so i'm going to actually yeah explain how frictions helps so yeah the problem and let's 
let's talk about how friction is trying to help to solve this problem. So friction is it's a, a project that we call it now connecting the world data, uh, being a kind of like a medium between different systems. So I think uh, probably the question like what is the relation to pandas, etc., will uh, pop up at some point. I just want to say now that uh, uh, the uh, kind of like the, the niche of frictionless is being just a helper to other uh, bigger projects and uh, we don't compete uh, with so 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 for example pandas just provide uh, standards and additional software uh, to improve uh, workflows that includes other instruments so frictionless data standards data software of course uh, community and uh, uh as again we call it frictions helps to remove friction from uh, data flows and uh, the first block is data standards and probably it was uh and it is uh it's uh the main uh, the most important part of uh, uh, the whole frictionless idea uh that if you have data, it's better to describe this data using some standard. So what does it mean? Um, uh, we have four uh, main standards, data package, data resource, data, uh, sorry, uh, table dialect and table schema. And uh, to to show the idea just uh, more easily. So you have uh, some CSV files and you can share these CSV files as it is, but you can create a data package. Data package is just a simple JSON uh, file that you can ship uh, with uh, these CSV files or Excel files or other files. Um, and this data package, you will be saying that in this package we have two tables, for example, here players and scores. And uh, and it's a data package. And in, for example, the first table we have columns, ID, and name. Which is an integer and a string. It's uh, it's really uh, similar uh, to, for example, database schema, DDL. But uh, in in comparison to uh, other systems like databases, uh, the idea of, of frictionless is being uh, just general standard, not tied to any like implementation like. Uh, Postgres database has like its own, for example, details and uh, like its other databases, like some something different. So you can't use it for like for general data files or something like this. So data package uh, has data resources like files. Uh, and those files are uh, described by dialect and schema. So I'm not showing here uh, resource and dialect because it's more technical, but uh, dialect is something like my CC file has like uh, some weird delimiter, not comma. So you just add this uh, as a separator to the dialect and uh, it will be uh, then uh, used by, by a reader. So yeah, basically it was an uh, introduction to the standards, but uh, I think it's hard to be, uh, perceive 
uh, standards, just you know, like this. So it will be uh, shown like more and more on our data software how standards work because on top of standards, friction data is data software, and I'm going to uh, we're going to have a four additional sections uh, to show the uh, how how you can you know get something from using these standards because uh, if you had just the standards like no validation no tooling it, it would be useful sorry useless but uh, frictionless fortunately uh, has tools for it so let's start from frictions framework it's a python uh, framework uh, you can find it on uh, the IP uh, as frictionless pi and uh, the goal is for framework is to uh, focus on table or data but uh, it can handle like any kind of data and basically it's just the implementation of a data package concept so uh, for this presentation i decided to go uh, with a, a command line interface because it's easier and uh, it will i think but it will be good enough to uh, showcase the idea of data packaging so um, you can uh, install uh, the framework uh, using like these commands one of them and uh, basically you can read data from a lot of sources uh, local remote files folders databases uh, different formats uh, cc excel parquet etc you can also uh, read data from uh, data portals like Seekan, Zenodo, github so for example um they start from a simple command a frictionless list and we're going to provide a path or a pattern to a data folder having some csv files and uh, frictions here just shows us uh, basic uh, structure of the so in, in this case it's a it's a data set so it's a set of uh, CSV tables it's a data set already so frictions creates here a data package shows here a data package uh, this data package uh, currently is not full it's only um, shallow information about data files so using frictions list you can check it out it's it's really quick you can you can provide here a xenodo url and it will do the same it will show all the files on uh, uh, in the xenodo uh, data set or a github or secan data set but uh, more interestingly the next command fiction described so uh, after seeing like the uh, shallow content of the data set you can check uh, you can ask uh, frictionless to uh, infer data types for you so uh, here is a here is a visual output here is a yaml or it can be json so you can uh, uh, see the boss so as we can see uh, frictions now provides uh, data types for cc files and uh, column names so next command frictions extract helps you uh, to get understanding of uh, tables content 
again, it's shown on the simplest uh, example on a small CSV file, but it can be um, as you know the data set, and it will show um, samples from all the files uh, in the data set. So the next command is export. And uh, now it uses uh, Zenodo. So you need to install additional dependencies to, to run this command. And the uh, explore command uh, uses uh, amazing uh, visit data uh, tool for command line uh, table uh, editing and uh, analysis. So here, um, here it's not shown here, but uh, having run this command and you can actually you can do you can do it in kind of like if you have a Python uh, interpreter, you can do it in in two lines of code. Pip install frictionless with uh, with the data in Zenodo and running this command, you get uh, this with the data editor already opened for all the uh, tabular files in this uh, Zenodo data set. So uh, if you check uh, the visit data documentation, you can uh, change the tables here using like special uh, keyboard buttons and uh, do uh, a lot of uh, different things like sorting, analysis, etc. So the next one is a uh, query and using the same data set. Uh, frictions can um, very quickly index all the tabular data and uh, bring you a prepared uh, SQLite uh, shell and database to explore the data from a, from a, from a, from the data set. So, for example, it's a kind of like boxers data set olympic games data set and here we can do really quick analysis so again it's only two lines of code and you can start uh quick data analysis in in cql from a like just a random um, like just some data set you run into on zenodo so Another option is using uh, pandas for analysis. So the same if you if you run script instead of uh, use script instead of query, you get uh, prepared data frames for this uh, data set. It's so kind of like a lot of them. Again, some extra dependencies here. Um, as uh, because frictions understand a lot of uh, formats, uh, it's uh, you can use it for data conversion. And uh, sometimes uh, we have a kind of like a big community of uh, data publishers, some government related, uh, some uh, in the in geosphere. And uh, they they, they uh, come with sometimes to us with like super weird, uh, for example, CSV formatting. Uh, for example, in Germany, so, some city publishing so weird CSVs. I, I, I didn't, uh, I have, I, I hadn't seen anything like this, like ne never, but uh, it's happening. So. Using frictions, you can just, you know, um, convert it like really quickly to a normal form of CSV to future publishing. And... Um, Evgeny, sorry for interrupt, but uh, we have one question related to the to this part. Can I... Please. 
Yeah, sure. Um, okay. We have one from Brandon. Uh, he says, how does frictionless integrate with me metadata, metadata schemas like DCAT or schema.org? Um, and yeah, that, that's the first one. And the other one is mine. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so there are, uh, there are different cases um, compared to other standards. For example, there is a there is a CSV on the web standard, which is really similar actually to frictionless data package, uh, but only for CSV. And uh, I will say that it's uh, like it's uh, the closest one to the data package, but it was I think developed. Uh, like five or more years ago, and currently there is no, I think, ongoing development. So this one uh, is like really alike. Uh, other standards are, you know, more like uh, just other levels compared to frictions. So uh, frictions data package is a open uh, specification uh, related to uh, properties. So it's really uh, usual when you have a data package and on top of uh, standards properties for data package like resources or types for columns, you just use um, some semantic uh, properties uh, uh, from some um, uh, vocabulary, uh, vocabularies. And uh, uh, data package provides kind of like a, skill it on for your data set base basic um, structure and types and then on top you can use scheme org for example type um, to uh, provide like additional semantic information uh, similarly uh, i think just on schema uh, data package was uh, uh, really inspired by json schema uh types and other decisions but it just uh, compared to json schema it just for table or mostly data so it's way easier to use table schema uh for uh, table or data description rather than uh, json schema although of course we have a, a lot of members and uh, we're going to work for example on dcat uh to mapper it was a really un, uh long going uh preparation discussion uh, on our in our community thank, thank you Evgeny. tengo i have uh, a related question from osvaldo leiva about and i was wondering this too he says if how does frictionless data ensure that the spatial data collected accurately reflect the geographical characteristics and distinct territorial significations of the specific area in question? Um, table schema standard standard for, the, uh, for describing types uh, of uh, tabular data uh, has uh, some special um, types like uh, GeoJSON, TopoJSON, and uh, like GeoPoint. But again, um, ensuring that, for example, the data has proper column uh, with uh, geo, uh, geo points, like latitude, longitude, uh the following validation like business logic let's say validation is happening uh on another level for example uh in some framework like uh great expectations or something like this so uh it's um frictions is more uh, kind of like orthogonal and uh detached from uh business logic like this if it makes sense please osvaldo brandon um if you have any other questions related related to your questions and the answers 
please do use the Q&A section and um, just to make sure everyone is getting the best of this workshop um, please uh, we have a uh, an interpretation in Spanish and maybe the terms data set or data package um, are not are not are not translated. Uh, just so you know data set is base de datos, data package is a paquete de datos. So um, just to make sure everyone is getting the best of this workshop, please do not hesitate using the QA section for this so we can improve. And I have another question from Pablo Mogollón, um, and it's about the, if this tool is freely available for, for, for personal or commercial, commercial use. I don't know about this, the license that fractionless data is using. Evgeny, can you clear that up? Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, and it's, that's it. It's very really, like easy one because uh, with open knowledge we like kind of like really dedicated to openness. So obviously, um, all this software uh, at frictionless MIT license, like really free license for software, and I think uh, the standards has even like unlicensed license if it makes sense for, for anyone, but it's, I think it's, it's a thing, it's a real thing, uh, unlicensed license. So it's, uh, it's absolutely uh, free, open source and uh, forever free and open source uh, uh, standards and software. Thank you, Evgeny. We can, we can go on to the, your presentation. Yeah, thank you. And uh, in general, yeah, uh, feel free to interrupt because uh, we have different blocks. So once um, you have uh, questions in uh, the Q and A, just yeah, just I think it it will be good if we can answer them. Like yeah, and uh, it was uh, the last slide for the for this section. And uh, with frictions, you can publish your uh data set files to uh seeken for example Zenodo in one command uh, but um this part was uh friction spy introduction frictions framework introduction but it didn't uh, touch basically the main thing of this uh framework the validation and uh, it was uh on purpose because uh, we will talk about validation and data packaging uh, in other sections. So uh, just uh, have in mind that uh, uh, this uh, was a introduction, but we will talk about validation later and the main uh, goal of uh, this frictions library, frictions pi is data validation uh, in the end. And uh, here we have a frictionless repository section, which is basically a frictionless uh, pi, frictionless framework, uh, binding to uh, implementation on for GitHub actions. And yeah, it, it will be about validation because basically the only, uh, the only function of this project is to validate data and validate data continuously. So let's start from setting up uh, frictionless uh, repository. And uh, I think uh, many of you know this uh, really nice uh, uh, GitHub's um, system called uh, workflows and uh, software developers use it like a lot just having a uh, ci uh, workflows uh, checking linting uh, testing their code when they push to github so frictionless repository 
does exactly the same, but for data. So if you uh, if you publish um, data on GitHub, and currently only GitHub is supported, but uh, we have a uh, kind of like a future request for other uh, platforms uh, like GitLab and uh, some else. So uh, it's not it's not uh, like fully tied to GitHub, but currently it's only implemented for GitHub. So uh, if you have, for example, a data set you uh, publish to GitHub or you work on GitHub with your colleague, uh, colleagues, you can add this uh, workflow file uh, to the standard uh, workflows folder. It's a uh, it's documentation. You can find, you can find uh, all the documentation uh, 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 from the uh, link will be shared. So, uh, it's, um, it's a little bit like uh, longer than two line commands, so you don't like remember this. So the idea that you provide a configuration to GitHub workflows, and then on every new commit to your data project on GitHub, uh, friction repository will be showing whether uh, the data is valid or not. And uh, if you click, for example, here, we got invalid data. And if you're clicking on the uh, validation link, it will show you validation report. So a little bit more about table or errors. So we have, a, I think, a list of around 100, maybe a little bit less uh, type of table and other errors. And uh, Frictionist uh, tries to catch uh, all of them. So, simple example, like in this data file, the column has a blank uh, label in the header, meaning that uh, it's probably um, this data might be like invalid and it, it needs to, uh, you know, it needs some attention or rechecking or duplicate label. The same if you have a CSV with duplicate labels, it's uh, kind of like, it's suspicious. You need to recheck. Maybe it's a uh, data collection error or something. And uh, like this, we have way more uh, errors. Like it's a uh, integer count, but there is a string or all your rows has 10 counts, but this row has 11 counts. Maybe it's a, a kind of like parsing separator error. So frictions repository helps to catch everything on the push stage. So here is an example like of, of other errors. You can catch different uh, error groups, and yes, that's I think that's a good that's a good one showing what what is frictionless uh, validation looks like in the command line interface. Uh, I didn't show this for frictions framework, but that's how frictions framework validation looks like. Um, so, in frictions repository, of course, you can. Uh, customize uh, the way it works and basically you provide just a data package or data package parts to the uh, configuration file and uh, for example group char what the, what what it means uh, group char it's uh, when you uh, separate your uh, numbers uh, in three number groups and uh, surprisingly, uh, a lot of parsers can just read numbers like this because uh, uh, comma uh, it's not a it's not a it's not a part of a normal number in programming. So you declare this, and uh, frictions will be able to 
read your data. Um, and yeah, you, you can add a uh, visual indication to your uh, data repository if it's passing, failing, like really similarly to what uh, software developers uh, do. So yeah, it was a section regarding uh, continuous data validation. So if you have questions, Yes, we do have a couple of questions here. Uh, Fernando says that um, pandas were mentioned, but I'm not sure. Uh, it wasn't clear to me if these are uh, an alternative or or they are or if they are complementary. Yeah, yeah, so. Uh, the project definitely uh, complementary. So, um, so for example, what uh, Pandas uh, does with a, a CSV file, it has a it has a, a function Pandas read CSV uh, with like twenty uh, arguments you can you can uh, pass to Pandas. So, in frictionless, for example, if there is a so in one previous slides, we published data to CKN. And when Frictions published data to CKN, it adds a data package JSON file that has uh, all the types of uh, your uh, CSV files or types of columns. So what you, what you can do is frictionless. You can just uh, open this data package, uh, select the resource, one of the tables, and uh, you can uh, say to frictionless just uh, export to pandas so you get your pandas data frame but uh, without providing uh, all these uh, additional arguments about separators data parsing number parsing it's all encapsulated into data package and it, it was uh, done once uh, during the publishing by the, the data publisher so that's yeah, pandas uh, even uh, definitely kind of like an, it, it not, not a competition, and pandas can be uh, run on top of frictionless uh, uh, standards and validation. But it's uh, I think it's it's it's, it's really good question. It's and and this uh, example with pandas read CSV, I think a really good uh, uh, case. Uh, to, you know to showcase where is frictionless lies in the ecosystem so it just helps pandas in this case to read uh, some published data with already provided metadata and actually uh, uh, usually it's just you, you know it's really hard to if you if there is on uh, there is a kind of like a csv on the web somewhere you just don't know what's what's uh, pandas read csv arguments you need to pass because there is no information so that's what frictionless tries to solve with the uh, data package and metadata thank you we have another one and please uh, do forward with if you are uh, satisfied with the answer um Fernando, Fernando was the one who asked that. Um, now Osvaldo has another question. He says, considering the differences between the scale and temporality in, in the data sources from the approach of frictionless data, how can we guarantee and verify the comparability and the uh, and the data and the data compiled and what are the the procedures that suggest to to improve or to or to correct a possible distortions and incongruencies uh, from the from this scale and temporality in the data i know it's a huge question <laughs> but um yeah. did you get that evgeny or should I repeat? Um, yes, maybe we can uh, 
get back to this one uh, later, maybe uh, we once were in Britain, <laughs> because it will I think, take some paper. Uh, so, but uh, uh, I think in general, again, um, this uh, is, uh, I mean, next, next layer on top of frictions, all this uh, happens. So uh, there is, there are no uh, built-in checks for like something like this in the uh, like bare standard data standard uh, data package. So, but uh, yeah, maybe, maybe uh, I, we need to return to this uh, a little bit later because I didn't, uh, uh, I missed some information from the question. Okay, okay. So maybe Osvaldo, if you can um, reframe your question, maybe mentioning um, a very specific example, we can we can do we can answer it better. Um, we do have another another not a question, but. Um, Joel Salazar says, if if you can share with us some cases, some success cases in which um, teams are already using, using frictionless uh, data and how much, uh, how difficult is to implement, for example, uh, yeah, and what are the requirements uh, for the basic team that that can implement this this product this tool um yeah we're going to have um, some use cases uh at the uh, at the end of the presentation uh, from like real world application of frictionless but uh, answering the second part uh, starting with frictionless is like really simple if you have a data set you just run one command in for your data package, and then you start uh, creating your data, your data set, your CSV, usually, or Excel files. Uh, these, these data package as a set, and uh, you can edit it uh, by, uh, by hands uh, in your text editor. I'll show some uh, UI later, but, um, it's a, it's a really simple because uh, you just infer uh, everything from uh, from your files, and later you can start uh, adding, like for example, human uh, readable information, like uh, titles of your columns on or data set, uh, like abstract, etc. But uh, starting is like really easy. Awesome. We can go. Uh, we can forward to the presentation, Evgeny. Uh, following a question about a, a question from Ramon Puga, he says, "Will it be possible to see some practical and simple example to know how the tool works?" I believe in this next part we are going to see that. So I I let you, Evgeny, continue to your presentation. Yeah, thank you. Um, so in, the, in this section, I was going to show you uh, our project called Wymark, uh, which is a little bit aside of uh, the general um, topic. So you'll get back to uh, validation and similar stuff uh, in the next section, but uh, Data is not only about validation, it's about uh, data storytelling as well. And the Wymark uh, is a project created for data journalists or software educators, or even Python developers. So it's a static site generator that supports a lot of additional markup that you can just add to the markdown file and uh, you'll get um, 
different uh, visual uh, widgets inside your uh, generated HTML files. Usually it's uh, kind of like it's a static, uh, statically hosted uh, website. So Markdown is really popular uh, syntax and I guess nowadays almost everyone uh, has used it at least once a few times. So we just in programming, we write documentation uh, using Markdown, but uh, you can use Markdown for whatever, like uh, data journalism. So here's an example of uh, a simple website we created during the pandemic. And uh, uh, the bottom line that um, it's kind of like a, um, kind of like evolved. Uh, it was it now it's now stopped because of course, the pandemic stopped so but when it was uh, working uh, it was updating like every night uh, 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 on a nightly basis and it has a lot of uh, different uh, reports and charts and uh, maps etc the the bottom line that it was basically created in in a week or maybe two weeks using Wiremark because uh, uh, Wiremark provides a lot of uh, different helpers and uh, additions to markdown so you can just really quickly go from the like idea of some data article data related article to publish to one on for example github pages so also why mark can be used for like software education, it's really similar to uh, Jupyter notebooks, but uh, it uses Markdown for script execu execution. So uh, you can add your uh, scripts inside the Markdown, or like uh, in R, it's really similar uh, to their system, and it will be uh, added to your uh, rendered document. So we, we got a few, I think, examples of uh, Python, uh, like small books we written in, in Weimark. And uh, it can be used also for Python development, but it's, it's I think, not the main focus of the, of the project. So um, what Weimark does, it adds uh, different widgets to, uh, to normal markdown. And there are a lot of plugins uh, you can add like videos. So, you know, music from SoundCloud or rendered data packages or kind of like validation reports from, from Frictions repository. It's, uh, it's really easy to customize. So you can add a plugin pie to, to to your project. And for example, uh, here we're just adding a simple update to the heading, but it's like it's really simple to write your plugin or use it in your project. And uh, here I want to uh, uh, linger on uh, on this. Uh, uh, rolling immunity uh, report we created uh, for the uh, COVID-19 uh, data portal we created uh, because I think it's a good example of uh, how uh, open data can uh, help uh, like to understand um, like what's happening and um, here uh, in Weimark, we created uh, this rolling immunity reports, and it seems to be it's not uh, we're not uh, scientists, and we're not uh, 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 
kind of like related to this scene. So it was just uh, showcasing the uh, the software, but uh, let's say consider kind of like uh, it's uh, for real. So um, we kind of find out using open data that, uh, for example, speed of uh, vaccination uh, actually was wasn't really uh, productive for some countries. So, for example, Israel uh, got vaccinated really fast. And uh, it was uh, kind of like uh, they, they were best uh, during the first uh, stage of vaccination. And then they, they got a real big uh, problem with uh, new cases because uh, it seems to be uh, the, they were kind of like rolling immunity. Uh, they were hit by the, by the speed of first wave of the vaccination. And countries... Uh, uh, who didn't have uh, kind of like a pattern like this, uh, didn't get this uh, uh, new waves after almost all uh, population were vaccinated. And, you know, this case was really, uh, really used by some uh, anti-vaccination lobby and people because they were saying that you know that the whole country was vaccinated but it doesn't work so your vaccine doesn't doesn't work so but with open data we can go through all this stuff and find uh, some clue about what's happening so um so, yeah it was a short introduction to Weimark and if you're interested uh you can find it on the part of oimark.frictionsdata.io. Um, going to the next section. Do you have any questions? Yes, we do have um, a question from Pavel Espinosa. He says that if we can use this tool to present demographic data in an investigation project in a scientific investigation project i assume we we can but can you explain more opinion um yeah yeah so i work based on like open state standards like vega and uh like csv or excel for tables using frictionless so whatever so again similarly to the standards it's uh kind of a like lower level just a tool helping you uh, to publish like any kind of investigation data etc and uh, I would recommend also looking at the um, need to remember the name a similar project uh, for Jupyter notebooks when you can publish uh, your notebooks uh, as the same as why as an OI mark uh, as a uh, HTML website. So, and of all projects like this, uh, totally kind of like independent and not related to what data, what reports, uh, what uh, kind of like insight you're going to uh, have there. Great. Um, we have another question from George. For, pardon, Jorge, Jorge, Jorge um, he says, is there any integration with AI or, um, or in, by any case, do you, or if this to have any API to do that? Um, uh, yeah, so uh, in the next section, uh, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, AI, AI integration uh, regarding uh, like charting. And uh, this tool, Limark, was uh, created like uh, in, the, in the 2022. So um, currently, is is getting like uh, it's becoming obvious for us that 
uh, we can really uh, simplify a lot of um, a lot of uh, kind of like uh, work using AI uh, as uh, I mean generative AI as uh, for example chart uh, writing helper or for other widgets. So it's not implemented yet, but it's uh, definitely what uh, will be we, we will be like looking at and for. Uh, really soon because it's 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 obvious thing okay great um i have another question from joel salazar that i didn't mention i forgot to translate that but it says what are the maximum gigabytes that a data set can have and also um i'm not sure if you answered this again but he asked about how what are the basic requirements from a team who wants to implement this in in from their skill set what are the skills that they need um so regarding the uh first one um sorry what, what was the first one uh, about the maximum of um yeah yeah thank you the yeah gig, it's, the it's, gigabytes yeah no worries yeah. i'm in i'm in portugal so it's getting like a little bit late my 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 son is already in bed so yeah sorry i am oh, so sorry. Uh, <laughs> no problem i'm really happy to be here uh so so uh, friction spy currently is a streaming uh, streaming uh, framework so there is no limitation regarding uh, size of data so it will be consuming a uh, constant amount of uh, memory uh, almost for all the work except for some checks optional checks here that needs to you know uh, create uh, aggregation of data uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, current implementation of friction spike can be uh, kind of a little bit slow on uh, uh, day, uh, date, data, uh, sorry, uh, date time related uh, uh, processing because uh, it's uh, really slow in Python. So, uh, as, as it, uh, it was asked regarding uh, use cases in one of our uh, use cases uh, uh, so we had we had this conversation regarding uh, uh, performance and in their case it was like uh, so kind of like uh, the way we work uh, we don't care if we need to wait you know like uh, one minute or like five minutes so it's it's not critical uh, so you can uh, kind of like process files of any size, but uh, if speed is critical, um, it might it might be a problem with friction spy currently in, in, uh, on current like iteration. But uh, if not, you can process like a, any size of data. Okay, great. We can we can continue. Yeah, thank you. And regarding the skill set, uh, what I'm going to show now, it's the visual interface. So uh, for different parts of uh, frictionless, uh, you need different uh, like skill set and it's it depends uh, on the uh, kind of like uh, user interface. So for example, frictions repository, uh, the GitHub implementation uh, basically doesn't require any, not like not basically, it doesn't require any programming, running commands, I mean command line interface. So you can you can have a team without a programmer. You just need to edit your data package uh, uh, descriptor, and GitHub will be validating 
so everything automatically showing visual reports again you, you don't need uh, to interpret it uh, using some software uh, friction spy is a python framework so it has a command line interface and uh, so you need skills so i think it's uh, easier uh, to run just uh, command line uh, commands but as well friction spy can be used as a normal python library so uh, if you have a programmer you can uh, uh, kind of like use uh, more powerful api in python but it's not a requirement to start with frictionless and uh, it's a good question for the for the next section because it will be about uh, user interface for frictions data it's uh, currently called frictions application unfortunately it's not yet released so it's uh, uh, kind of like a introduction uh, and uh, release it as beta uh, in April on CSVConf but um, we're working on the version one like exactly now so uh, it's not recommended to uh, try it now but uh, when it's released like uh, maybe this month maybe next month uh, I really like suggest you to try it if you like it so frictions application it's uh, basically it's a UI it's a user uh, interface for the whole project for the data standards and for data validation and uh, also it includes uh, data visualizations so to start uh, from the interface and uh, even more broadly uh, what is uh, what is it uh, frictions application is a desktop application like for example like zoom running on your computer so you can just download uh, the executable and start it on your computer so it's not it's not uh, cloud-based it's not uh, web-based so it's a data project and uh, it's a data editor basically and it works on on your computer so there is no any like uh, usual problem with the uh, sensitive data or vendor walk or something so you just it basically similar to like programming uh editor like id like we code so but but it, but it's uh, open source and you know forever free of course uh so it runs your computer as a desktop application and it has interface like really like other uh, uh integrated uh environments like I mentioned with Scott or like Visual Studio so the of course the main uh the main part of this uh software is table your data so for example here we have a table and you can explore it uh, it uses a, a database under the hood so it's it can open like files of any size you can um, paginate them sort etc um, it shows data package here for your files so basically uh, it's it's last development in frictionless and uh, we've been uh, we have been you know uh, coming to this idea last years that uh, we, we were creating like new uh, software more and more user friendly but it, it was still enough for example friction repository is a uh, not for non-programmers but you still need to use github you need to you uh, to write um, workflow definitions still kind of like not really uh, not really works for really non-technical people so frictions application is really for non-technical people it's no code uh, mostly but uh, for like majority of cases like no code at all so 
Yeah, so you open your table, for example, here, and here's your data package. You can, instead of writing it by hand, so inferring and editing, you can just use visual interface to uh, update everything I mentioned in the uh, data standards uh, section. Also, uh, Frictions application validates all your files, but uh, it's, uh, the most importantly, it's uh, for tables. So uh, similarly to how Frictions repository does it on GitHub, it does it uh, on your computer. So you just click on the, uh, for example, here table CSV and you get the validation status. So yeah, the main thing, tables. So tables interface is a like a normal uh, table viewer and editor, but also it shows you validation reports, a set metadata. If for, for CSV, you can see um, data source, so like text representation of your data. And uh, you can sorting, paginating, etc. cetera. But uh, uh, the area when like the frictions application is really uh, like, can really like shy, uh, shine is uh, finding errors. So consider we have a table like really, really like big one. And uh, first of all, it got automatically validated when you open it, but uh, it's not enough because uh, if, if a big table and it's really hard to find like errors, where is it? So frictions here, showing if you if you click on errors it shows errored roles type uh, kind of description of errors then you can find it in your source and uh, you can fix the error so you can just uh, edit it as a normal excel and save so Metadata. Uh, the whole block we were talking about the data package and data standards. That's how you can uh, do it uh, in visual interface. So in this case, um, we're going to publish this file, but uh, it's not obvious what what exactly this file is about. And uh, data consumer won't have an idea. So here we just add like title, a description, uh, types already inferred, but uh, we can also, we can also change types and uh, like column information. So uh, the next thing what you can do is uh, running CQL on your uh, CSV and like Excel and other files, which is a, a kind of like a modern approach in many systems uh, like Spark or like DuckDB. But here you can uh, do it in a visual interface. So basically, um, all your tabular uh, data uh, here indexed uh, when you like decide uh, to click on the index button or just open them and then you can start querying using SQL uh, just your C CSV files and uh, later you can save your SQL views and use them uh, as again as normal tables so you can uh, uh, nest your um, like analytical requests so also it shows your uh, data model in terms of uh, like structure and the types of your data or the whole uh, data set. And uh, as said, it's uh, just it's it just a folder on your computer. So you when you open the application, you just decide uh, what folder to work on, like a project uh, in uh, software development. Um, 
Fluxus application supports uh, creating charts using um, Vegawide, really great uh, specification, open standard for charting. So um, you can create a chart and using uh, your tables and views here. I'll show it a little bit later how, how to um, reuse the model maps again. So if you have a, a GeoJSON file, you can open it. If uh, also the top of JSON, or you can uh, create it like ordinary files, uh, which is kind of like, it's, it's, it looks like simple, but uh, actually like for, for example, open refine, you can't, uh, you can open only tables and uh, usually a data set, a normal data set is a like set because the data set of uh, different uh, files like CSV tables, uh, PDFs, uh, uh, readme documents, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, for working with data, you really need to be able to open all the data. And uh, again, here, for example, we can add a license for, for this cat and it will be shown later so that we can publish then uh, uh, what we want to publish as a data package. And when you edit, uh, metadata like for uh, single files, individual files, then it will be uh, automatically added to the data package you're publishing, for example. So articles, uh, data storytelling. So uh, similarly to Limark, uh, you can write data stories here and then publish them, for example, on GitHub pages. Uh, but uh, it's uh, simpler than in Weimark. Uh, you can just reference your files, kind of like mention them or insert them, and it will be uh, processed and included into your uh, data article. So yeah, the last the last uh, piece, and basically what. Uh, we talked already like a few times already uh, packaging data packaging so you have files and you putting them into a data package so you create a data package you add resources you check that it's valid and for example you can publish uh, a whole data set to second or like other data targets like Zenodo or GitHub. And uh, on CKN, it will be with your data files, but uh, with the data package as well, as it been mentioned. And uh, what does that mean? So uh, data set published like this can be uh, opened back in uh, frictions application or frictions framework or in other uh, like implementations so like for R we have frictions R library great great library and frictions JS but uh, in general uh, it's not uh, kind of like tied to frictionless project it can be used uh, and it's, it's used for by other projects uh, this data package can be opened without losing any information about uh, data. So it's already includes all the types, all the human uh, readable information. So uh, it's uh, it's that's that's data interoperability. Uh, when you have when you don't lose uh, any information about your data uh, on the uh, on this age edge. Uh, between published and consumed. So a little bit about AI. Uh, we added uh, just lately uh, some integrations currently uh, with ChatGPT. 
uh, but um, of course it uh, it's uh, it's can it can be like any generative AI and I think in a few years it will be like open source uh, alternatives or something like this so let me show what you can do using AI in frictions application so here uh, we're creating a map again based on the open standard uh GeoJSON. So just generative AI created. Uh, GeoJSON for us and frictions application is able to uh, open this file and uh, basically um, you can do whatever your imagination uh, you, you know can create uh, using this so just a few months ago we had a we had a uh, proposal to write uh, for some uh, open call and our uh, operations asked me uh, to create uh, a map of, of open knowledge presence and it took me like a few hours uh, i was like using uh, chat gpt to generate uh, your json for uh, countries we live in and then i was going to geojson.io to uh, create pictures but uh, it i'm a i'm a tech person and for non-tech persons this task is basically unreal and here you can just uh, uh, do it like in a in one sentence so let me show a little bit a little bit more about ai integration Let's start. Um, let's create a kind of like football related uh, stuff. So we're asking uh, we're asking Frictions application to write an article about uh, Marta, the football player from Brazil, and uh, of course we we don't recommend to write articles just uh, using generative AI but, but it's uh, it can be really used uh, to help to help you you know start or to learn something and uh, in this case uh, we created uh, this article later we can um, add as it, 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 it was shown uh, in previous slides we can add to this article for example, uh, charts or maps or whatever, and publish this article. But currently, we're asking uh, for data. So, uh, golden balls by uh, 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 women uh, players. And Marta has six golden balls. And what we want to create a bar chart um, for, we mentioned here this table using this uh, mention syntax and uh, AI creates a bar chart for us based on the data again AI provided so we need to recheck to be honest uh, and then we can we can use a chart editor here to update the chart but if you don't if you are not like tech person you don't know uh, you you know anything about Vegalite or you just scared uh, because of uh, you know these forms? Uh, you can ask AI to do it for you. In this case, uh, we ordered uh, bars and uh, added two tips. And the um, last example, just just for fun. But in, but in general. Uh, we just started working on it, and there is a uh, basically endless amount of uh, ways 
it can be used while we have already a whole data model and uh, different separating different uh, data uh, formats and types so i think we will be investing in this uh, future like really hard like uh, going soon um okay so uh we're coming to the outro um do we have any questions thank you Kenny. awesome i really i'm really excited about um uh, the release i hope it's this year because it looks really fun to to play with um I do have a question from Joel that I'm, I think it's interesting because he, he mentions he mentions that he works at, um, at the subnational level government and he's been working around um, 15 years uh, creating creating a platform from MySQL and PHP. Um, but he wonders that the um, to actually use frictionless data, um, is it convenient? Um, is it better to extract the data from these platforms that are being used? Uh, because he knows that it they are not going to be replaced by something newer, but instead he mentions that if it's better to extract the data from these platforms and 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 use frictionless data to to run it in a Jupyter notebook, for example. Um, so he, it's like a case that he is making. Um, if that's what do you think about that? Um, thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, I think that. Um just uh, to uh, we can put it this way uh, that um, frictionless solved the problem of data transport so it's uh, it's useful uh, on the boundary of systems of people or like communities or government and society so uh, if you have a kind of like a working project using uh, it's a, it's kind of like internal project using mysql and uh, like other kinds uh, other pieces so stack uh, stack and uh, it works uh, internally i think there there is uh, there is no like a lot of space for frictionless but once uh, you need to publish some data from for example this mysql uh, database that's where frictionless uh, comes to play. So um, I think last uh, on the last CCP conf, uh, we had a really great presentation from uh, Augusto Herman uh, from Brazil, uh, from the uh, TechC, one of uh, it, one of his project TechC that uh, go Brazil, and uh, they created a huge pipeline and project to track um, uh, to publish data about uh, transportation uh, civil servants in Brazil they they have a kind of like this system and uh, civil servants uh, have to report uh, taxi uh, demands so um, it uses like a lot of technologies their uh, ETL uh, to Apache airflow and others and but on the uh, stage of uh, publishing data to uh, uh, Brazil Seekan uh, instance they used frictionless uh, to provide metadata so uh, consumers can uh, can better uh, access uh, uh, the data they publish so here frictions play just you know just kind of like it's it's a it's a just a team player uh it, it can uh uh can like play a role 
of uh, data publishing metadata mostly. So it really depends on the on the situation. So I would use fictions when when you need to transport data or publish data. Thank you, Evgeny. I'm think I think we're going to to also close um, with that question because we have another ones, but. I'm leaving you all the, the survey to gather your feedback in the chat. You can go and click the survey monkeys that you see there. You can also um, submit your personal, your contact info. So if you want to keep in touch with the Knowledge Foundation uh, team, thank you so much, Evgeny, I'm going to to change a little uh, from English text to Spanish. Muchas gracias a la Knowledge Foundation. Um, ustedes están haciendo un papel súper fundamental para la transformación digital. Hemos tenido mucha interacción y se nos ha hecho corto el tiempo. En los próximos días vamos a enviar la grabación del evento junto a un survey de feedback. Y um, para que nos digan si quieren conectarse con las herramientas que se presentaron hoy. Esperamos verlos a todos en nuestros próximos eventos y no se olviden de inscribirse a la red Code for the Dev. Muchas gracias, Evgeny. Muchas gracias a todos, a todas por conectarse. Mucho gusto. Chao.